and you are going to love the Fast Pitch TV show. We're bringing you more interviews, more videos, and more product reviews than anyone else on the planet. Sit back and get ready. Here's the Fast Pitch TV show. Hello, I'm your host, Gary Leland, and this is the Fast Pitch TV show. And on this week's show, I'm going to feature Coach Carol Brueggemann from the University of Louisville. Carol gave a session called Organizing Practices to Produce Game Day Results, and she gave this clinic at Softball Con in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, they allowed me to film it for you, and on this episode, I'm going to bring you part one of her clinic. But before we go to what part one of the clinic, I'd like to show you this short video for the Fast Pitch Magazine that I publish. It's called the Fast Pitch Magazine. <laughs> Coaches care, right? No. What do you What do you want them to say? That it was productive. When they left practice, they felt like it was productive. What else? Fun. That it was fun. They had a good time. Absolutely, that's important. Now, fun can mean a lot of things, but you want them to, to definitely feel like they enjoyed it. What else? What else would you want your player to say? <laughs> they were pushed. They were challenged. Absolutely. Here's what I want our players to say: that they feel prepared. Because really, isn't that what competition is all about, feeling prepared? That's where your confidence comes from, by the way. Preparation, period. Okay, leads to confidence. They were encouraged and they were motivated. We gave them hope a lot, which hope really stands for hold on, possibilities exist. You never want them to quit, right? Hold on, possibilities exist. They see opportunities. That they embraced and enjoyed competition, they felt passionate. I mean, this is, this is ideal. They're not going to feel this way every day. But that's what I, I hope they can pick one or two words out of there every day when they're leaving. I'm sure you do too. So when you think about your practices in general, if this is the end goal, what we want someone to say about our practice and what we want our players to say about practice, then we've got to design practices accordingly. Our goal, certainly at Louisville, is that they leave practice a better player every day. And I'll ask them sometimes when they're walking out, what did you get better at today? And maybe it's one little thing. Oh, my, my crossover step with my forehand going to a ball, I, I really, I figured it out. I was coming up too high, I need to stay lower. Whatever it might be. We have practice expectations that we hand out. Probably you all do as well, or at least you talk about them. Um, we, we have no sitting at practice ever. There is never time to sit down at practice, period, unless you're injured, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Be open to being coached. <laughs> we have to say that sometimes which our players do a good job, but you do have to say that. So we have some expectations, and I think it's important, okay? If you walked up to our practice, or if I walked up to your practice, and I was to describe your team, okay? So I want you to think about that. If I, were to, if I left your practice, I'd man, that team is, okay, fill in the blank. You're all thinking. Here's what I'd like you to say about our team. They gave great effort. They had great attitudes. They had drive. They were selfless. This is a team sport. They were competitive, they were focused. I would hope you could say a lot of those things after coming to our practice. Now again, is it gonna be perfect every day? There is no way. We all know that. We do deal with humans, and we're human. So it's not gonna be perfect, but again, if these are the end goals, we're gonna talk about how to plan practice here in a minute. We gotta keep, we gotta keep the end in mind, right? We don't wanna do drills just to do drills. We're doing drills to become better in game competition and to have them be able to respond this way. Okay? We make a mistake, we don't want to hang our heads, we don't want to kick the dirt. I have no idea how that has ever helped someone in their entire life. If anyone can help me explain that, I would love to know. But we don't allow that behavior because it's not helping us. So we always go back to how are we going to change that. But we create practices where they fail. We create practices where sometimes they fail because they have to handle it. Our sport is about failure. How you handle it determines whether you win or lose a lot of times. Okay. All right, this is important. Coaches, if I were to describe you after practices, okay, 
okay? Man, that coach is, what do you want me or your colleagues to say about you at practice, okay? What do you want us to say or feel? Anybody? Describing yourselves. Positive. That you were positive, which can be a challenge some days, huh? Okay? Right. But we're positive overall, that we were fair, we treated everyone the same. Organized. We were organized. Man, that coach is organized. They run a great practice. They're on time. What else? Pushes. He pushes and encourages people, challenges them, he or she, okay, yeah, what else? Um, that they love what they're doing, they're passionate. Man, that coach is into it, right? Their body language was good, whatever it might be. Okay, here's some things that, that I hope you would feel about a coach at practice, that they were prepared, first and foremost. We can't just wing it at practice. You cannot just wing it at practice. You need to spend more time planning practice than executing it sometimes. Sometimes. That, that uh, the coach was prepared, they had a plan. There were effective communication methods. Sometimes they need a stern redirect. It was effective. Sometimes they need that. Sometimes they need a lot of encouragement. You can do this. That we were controlled and there was a good tempo. The coach had a good tempo. Be the face your team needs to see. Everybody's heard of Mike Krzyzewski in this room. He's probably one of the greatest basketball coaches to ever live. <laughs> I love his coaching books, by the way. They're great. But he says all the time, be the face your team needs to see. And what he means by that in practice or in competition, if, if you're, think about it, if you're coaching your team and you have a team this year, they're 12-0, they're ranked in the top five of your state, and you're playing a team that's 0-12, and they're not very good this year. They're not very good. And your team comes into the game, maybe not trying to be this way, but they come into the game, in general, they're probably going to be pretty what? Intense and uptight or relaxed? Relaxed. Probably to the point of goofing off, dinking around, right? Not taking it seriously. Oh, we got this one in the bag. Mike Krzyzewski would say, be the face your team needs to see. On those days, the coach needs to have be sharp with warm-ups, sharp with the redirect, get them focused, get them going, because that's what the team needs. And on days where, where, where Dukes play North Carolina and they're ranked number one, number two in the country, you don't think they're a little nervous, a little intense? Of course they are. And of course you are as a coach, but be the face your team needs to see. Relax, confident, hey, we, let's do this, this is the plan, here, here we go. So I think that's important at practice too. If your team just came off a loss where they battled and they battled and they battled and it went extra innings and the winning hit by the other team was scored on a check swing little bloop that landed right on the chalk line. You know, you know your team is feeling bad. You know, maybe you need to be very encouraging the next day even though it's a loss. By the same token, you, know, you all know where I'm going next. If they played very poorly, had poor effort, whatever it might be. So what you face your team needs to see, I think that's very important to practice. Here's a big question I want you to think about before we get into planning here. Would you play for yourself? You don't have to answer that out loud, but why or why not? You should be able to ask yourself that every day. That's what we're going for every day. Okay, how many of you um, have, you work with a staff of, you know, head coach, assistant coach, you have a staff? A lot of you. How many of you is just yourself? Staff meetings are in the mirror. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I know. Good idea. <laughs> Good for you all. That's tough. Okay? But if you have a staff, use them. If you don't have a staff, I'm sure you have friends you call, colleagues. Use them. And Google's a very powerful thing these days. Got a lot of information, but know your staff's strength and use them. Make sure you communicate with your staff. However it works for you as a staff. Some people like to meet before practice. Some people's jobs and careers do not allow for that. Maybe after practice for 10 minutes goes a long way. Here's how it went today at my stations. Here's what I think we need to do. Boom. Tomorrow, whatever it might be. But the most important thing is to communicate with your staff. Very important as coaches as we head into practices to learn the game. The rules change. Strategies change. Um, <clears throat> When I played, the strategy was to find a way to score a run. Some of you in this room remember that. We used a white ball by Dudley. After the third inning, if you shook it, it, it shook. I mean, it had like, you know, it rattled because the core wasn't very good. 
Um, the pitching mound was at 40 feet, not 43. The bats were nothing like they are today. And we sheared a bunch of them, we used them for three years. So they were dead as dead could be with a dead ball from a 40 feet pitcher throwing. There wasn't a lot of offense going on. If you were a 300 hitter, you were unbelievable. Now, if you're a 400 hitter, you're unbelievable at the college level. Because we've changed technology, right? We move the mound back 43, we use a bright yellow ball, you can't miss it. The, you shake it after three games, it doesn't really mess too much. The core is pretty high, pretty tight. The bats are unbelievable. I love to golf in general. I don't get to do it a lot, but I love to golf. I bought my first new set of clubs in about 12 years last year. I mean, I can, same swing, same person, and I can hit the ball a heck of a lot further. Those clubs are awesome. <laughs> same thing with a bat. I would love to play today with a bat. So it is important to know that. If you're down four to zero in a game today in the second inning, is it over? Heck no. When I played, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. That's just, so it's very important to know trends, know what's going on, and make sure, uh, you know, we stay current on all those things, okay? And I know you're all doing this. Things to consider with practice, okay? How much time do you have? How much time do you have? Do you have one hour? Do you have two hours? Do you have one hour in a batting cage and one hour on the field? Do you have a gym? Okay, so we'll talk about time and equipment a little bit. Do you have one set of bases? Do you have five set of bases? So we have to think about all these things and we all have different parameters that we work with. What are our facilities? What's our staff? <clears throat> if we're doing stations and we have one coach and we have two coaches but we want 20 stations, put a card right in front. If you're off the tee, you have 10 swings on a high pitch up the middle, 10 swings on a low pitch inside. To give them reps because now they're their own coach standing there. Give them reps. But if you have a staff member there, put the ball on the tee and talk to them, great. And what part of the season is it? So all of these things when we start to plan a practice are very important in our practice plan. Are we going from 8 in the morning till 10 outside on a day like today? You're going to freeze. So you got to bundle up. Are you going from 9 at night till 10 at night in a gym and you literally have to, every hour on the hour, people are rotating in so you have to be very efficient. So all those things we have to consider. Practice is for coaches and games are for players. Practice is for coaches, games are for players. The majority of your teaching and coaching occurs in, in practice. You all agree? Absolutely. I feel so bad. I'll, you know, I can't tell you any travel ball games I watch in the summer and in the fall. And I always feel so bad for the young lady who gets in the box, you know, it's runner one, tight game, and she takes a swing and she backs out and third base is coach, keep your hands up, keep your elbow out, get your weight on your back foot, swing at the high pitch. So she gets back in the box and you know, she's thinking about 500 things. How in the heck is she ever gonna get a hit? Then she steps out again. No, not that pitch, get your elbow up higher, left elbow up. Probably not a great time to do a lot of teaching at that moment. I'm sure you all agree. Do your teaching and practice. During the games, you're, you become almost their best friend. You gotta encourage them, you gotta trust them, you gotta go to war with what you got. We strategize during the game. If their corners are always playing back and they appear slow, or they have a, you look at the stat sheet for the game and they have, you know, 20 errors each, you may strategize and say, we can, we gotta bunt against this team a little more. That's our job on game day, strategize. Batting orders, uh, can we run on this team? But in terms of, uh, oh no, lost our thing. In terms of, well, I'll just keep, I'll keep going here, because I can go. Do you all have an outline at least? Okay. Uh, in terms of practice, that's when we want to do our teaching. On game day, encourage them. You know, if they have the ugly swing in the world, that looks great. Susie, keep swinging. And then in practice, go fix it. Because we've just got to stay, we've got to stay on top of what we're doing with them during practice. That's where our teaching needs to occur. Co practice is our time. Game day is their time. Key components of practice, great practice, okay? Effective communication, number one. Effective communication. If you cannot communicate, you're gonna struggle as a coach. It's just a non-negotiable. We, we don't have a profession where we sit in a cubicle and just, we, we, have, we deal with humans, people, all the time. We have to communicate. You must be organized to have a great practice. It must be challenging. 
make it worth their while to come. Make it worth their while to come. And there has to be a good mix, in my opinion, of fundamentals and strategies. Every day, maybe you do the same thing. To get them warmed up, that's good. It gets them in a routine. But then you also have to have some fresh, some strategies, something like that. And we talked about this, that the next slide talks about communication. Has to be a two-way message, remember, with communication. Can you go see if Matt's out there or anybody's out there? This thing just for some reason did. Thank you. Uh, practice in on communication on your handout. Post practice in the dugout so the team can prepare. How many of you like to post practice? I've not, I've gone back and forth on this for 20 years. Yep, a couple. How many of you don't post practice at all? Okay, how many of you don't ever do practice? <laughs> I mean, my goodness. Maybe you never thought about it. I've gone back and forth with this over 20 years. Sometimes it's good to post practice because they can see what they're doing for the day and it mentally gets them, gets them ready. We're doing first and thirds today. Get ready. Okay? Or we're doing a live whatever, or whatever it might be. There's some real value in that. Sometimes it's good when they come and they don't know what's going on. There's value in that as well. What I recommend if you do post practice is leave one thing off and that is the time. Because we all know we change our minds sometimes. If a drill's going well, move on. If it's not going well and you feel like you need to stick with it, stick with it. But if Susie looked at, we're supposed to be done at 640 with this drill, and we're not, you know, you just don't even want to worry about that. What, when I used to post, this year we're not doing it, but we have the last few years. We'll probably go back, you know, changes. But this year, or, or the first thing they used to do when they get to practice, is they look at the practice plan, and what are they looking for? What are they looking for? When it's over! Forget the times. Do not put the times on. You're exactly, they go, oh, 5.30. Like, really? All that time we spent on that, and that's what you're worried about? But that's what they worry about. So I would leave the times on. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, we do little things every day when we start practice. You know, we have a warm-up routine, a dynamic warm-up routine. And then we all get in a circle, and one of our players has a quote for the day. It's all pre-signed. And they bring a quote, whatever they feel our team needs and why they picked that quote. They've done a really good job this year. We've been doing this for years, but this year it's been very good. And then off we go into practice. So we kind of have that routine to get, to get our mindset. I'm sure you have some of yours. Um, girls will be girls. Let them connect at some point. How true is that? Um, it's very difficult. We are culturally made up to be very social human beings. It's very difficult when they come from, in our case, class, whatever they're doing, in your case, school all day, or travel ball, they come from different communities. It's very difficult when they see each other that the minute they step on the field, okay, no talking, we're all business, let's go, let's go to work. It's very difficult. You can do it, it's just, it's very difficult. So there has to be some time where you allow them to connect, whether that's during your stretching time, which is what I would recommend, so they get that out of the way, get all their things figured out, you know, who they're following on Twitter now and all that, and get it out of the way, and then once you start throwing, or once you start your stations, then off they go. But they feel they feel better if they can connect. Coach Candrea, Mike Candrea, again, one of the greatest coaches in our sport, he coached baseball for a long time before he coached softball. I don't know if a lot of you knew that or not. He's coached softball for a long time now, but he used to coach baseball. So he's coached men and he's coached women, and some of you in this room probably do the same thing. Maybe you coach boys something and girls something. But they always ask him, what's the biggest difference between coaching men and women? And he said, it's very simple in his mind. Men or guys need to play good at their sport to feel good about themselves. Women need to feel good before they're going to play good. Simpl it's very simplistic, but there's a lot of truth to that. So we got to give them time to connect. They got to feel good about what they're doing. Uh, again, just some little tips that we do. We, we have an accountability partner. We have a practice player of the week. Practice player of the week could be somebody that performed really well, but it also could be just somebody who is really into it, focused, selfless, whatever it might be. They get to wear a little special jersey the next week. Um, things about practice. What time of year is it? If it's your preseason, which I bet a lot of you are going into your preseason. I bet a lot of you are. If it's your preseason, you're focusing a lot on your fundamentals. Catching, throwing, bunting, running. Fundamentals. And your conditioning. Our preseason, we kind of look at it as our fall season. We spend a ton of time on fundamentals. We spend a ton of time on conditioning. A lot of time on that. In season, which is what, as you know, we are now. I mean, we're, well, we're still in our preseason, but we're literally 
week and a half away. It just, for some reason, went up. I don't think I stepped on it, but I might. <laughs> this one, this chord's a little tricky too. In season, we're focusing more on team development. So right now, our practices are very team driven, very situational driven. Offense and defense situations, pitching situations, always fundamentals, and then we, of course, have to maintain our conditioning. We're working a lot on game-like situations because now we're actually preparing to play, taking all that information. Okay, also have to think about where you are, which we talked about. Are you outside, are you inside, are you in combination? Do you need travel time, facilities? All of those things are very important. Okay, practice. This one's critical. We talked about this in terms of how we want to be perceived as a coach at practice. If I walked up to one of your practices, you know, how would I describe you? That whole thing. You set the tone for practice, period. Your team will read you like a book. If you come in with a negative attitude, or you're tired, or you just don't feel like being there that day, or you are crabby, or whatever it might be, you will not have a good practice. And we ask them to put everything else away when they come to practice, right? Leave all your personal crap at the door. This is practice time. This should be the best time of your day. And we have to do the same thing. It's critical to have a good practice. You must have a positive attitude, you must dress sharp, look sharp, talk sharp. All of those things go a long way. Image does matter. Image does matter. Another thing for your practice, be organized. We talked about that. I believe you brought that up. It's very important to be organized. Who's going where? What groups do you have? What equipment? How are they rotating? The more you can pre-plan, the more efficient your practice will run. Now, some of you say, I'd love to have two hours to plan practice, but I come right from my job, I have this, I have to drop the kids off here. I get it. We all are busy people. But the more you can do this, the better. The more you can do this, the better. Also knowing that no matter how well you plan it, no matter how well you plan it, something will throw you a little bit off. You got your perfect drills, your perfect groups, and then, oh, Susie's sick today, she's not coming, so you gotta switch your rotations. Whatever it might be. Coach can't come. He's, you know, his kid's sick, whatever it might be. So you have to be very flexible as well. Coach Do you need a softball bat? Do you want to save $30? Softballjunk.com is offering an additional $30 discount off the price of all non-sale softball bats on their website. That's right, $30. So the next time you buy a bat, go to softballjunk.com and enter the code FPTV30 during checkout. And wham! You just put a cool $30 in your pocket. Welcome back. Now that last short clip, that was my daughter Amanda and she was telling you about my website, softballjunk.com. Make sure and write down the code number she gave you, FPTV30, because when you buy a softball bat on my website, you can enter that code at checkout and save yourself $30. And you can use the code over and over and over. It's a really great deal. You just need to remember the code and again, that was FPTV30. Now, if you enjoy the show, I ask that you at least check out my website, softballjunk.com, the next time you're looking for softball equipment. If I offer you a competitive price, well, please buy from me and show your support what I'm doing here. I hope you enjoyed Carol's session. And don't forget to come back next week for part two of her clinic. Please tell your friends about the Fast Pitch TV show. And make sure and take a look at my website, fastpitch.tv. Until next time, this is Gary Leland saying goodbye and thanks for watching. This show is a member of the Fast Pitch TV network. See all our shows and blogs at www.fastpitch.tv.